Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the governor asks the U.S. Supreme Court to delay a ruling on driver's licenses for Dreamers. And the state's new schools chief says her first priority in office will not be tackling Common Core. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Aliyah Rao of the Arizona Republic, Jeremy Duda from the Arizona Capital Times, and Luigi Del Puerto, also of the Arizona Capital Times. Governor Brewer's attorneys want the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved in the state's attempts to ban driver's licenses to Dreamers, specifically Aaliyah. Uh, Justice Kennedy, they want him to stay this. What's going on all here? Basically, the Ninth Circuit <laughs> declined to have an in bank hearing of the case. So they lost their case originally. They appealed to the Ninth Circuit again. Ninth Circuit said, there's not a single judge here who wants to hear this case. We stand by. We believe what you're doing is unconstitutional. Brewer then asked Kennedy for an emergency stay to halt the driver's licenses from going into effect for the DACA recipients. And again, this case involves uh, the state basically saying no licenses to folks who are undocumented, unauthorized, if you will. Yeah, this is about uh, 25,000 people or so who uh, granted temporary legal status by Obama's order in 2012. And, you know, the state's argument is, uh, you know, a lot of it is uh, irreparable harm and how difficult this will be. Basically, if you start giving away these driver's licenses and the Supreme Court later overturns this ruling, you know, it's pretty hard to un unring that bell, is the, the governor's ar office's argument. And also don't forget that you know, this originally started with DACA, which is a relatively small program. If the Supreme Court says the state has to give them licenses, what about the you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of folks in Arizona who would be granted temporary legal status under the more recent executive action from the Obama administration a few weeks ago? Yeah, uh, Jeremy's right. It, it, the original executive order only dealt with the, the Dreamers, that uh, population. But before then, the state was already issuing driver licenses to DACA recipients. This is the Deferred Action Program where uh, immigration agents have the, what you call, prosecutorial discretion whether to deport somebody or not, or to halt that, that deportation. And once you are grant, granted a, a DACA, this Deferred Action Program, uh, before this executive order, you could get a driver license. What the Obama administration did, of course, was extend it specifically to the Dreamers, and that started this uh, controversy in uh, this case. And, and the courts basically said you can't target Dreamers without the other folks, and the state said, all right, we'll target the other folks too. Yeah, nobody gets a license. Though. Yeah. That's kind of where, where they've been wanting to go. Now, uh, uh, Governor-elect Ducey, what's his position on all this? He's basically said he supports Governor Brewer's position on it, her executive order on it, but whatever the court does, he will go along with that. He's not going to kind of oppose the courts on it. Not going not to get in front of that particular parade? Um, not right now, anyway. You know, uh, there's a, a number of lawsuits that uh, Doug Ducey's inheriting from Jan Brewer, and he's, for most of them, he's very reticent to say what he's going to do with them. Oh, we're going to defer to Jan Brewer. She's the governor right now. We're examining all these things. You know, wait till January 5th when uh, he actually takes office. On this one, he's actually at least somewhat signaled what he will do by saying he would keep Governor Brewer's driver's license ban in place, and the only way you can do that is if you continue fighting this court case. Interesting. And of course, you know, by saying that he's going to defer to whatever the court opinion is going to be, it's a very safe and very convenient answer. How else, what else could he do <laughs> if basically the United States Supreme Court said, nope, you've got to stop what you're doing. You've got to listen to the Court of Appeals and provide these driver licenses. And this means what licenses, if, not, if, if everything stays as is, licenses could be issued... We're hearing what as of Tuesday, as I of think, Tuesday. possibly. It depends on Kennedy and how quickly he moves, but it could be early next week. Any indication of how quickly uh, the court moves on something like this? Uh, I don't know. It's the Supreme Court. They can kind yeah. of do whatever they want to do. But, uh, you know, if they, don't, if they don't move quickly, you know, this, uh, you know, the lower courts might just say, okay, you know, the, this order is final. Start giving out those licenses. Yeah, and you talk about unringing the bell. Once the a driver's licenses are issued, bell rung. Right, and uh, based on recent history, if you look at some of the more controversial cases that had been before the U.S. Supreme Court, rather with the Court of Appeals, and there had been a an ask for a stay with the U.S. Supreme Court, it's been pretty quick, uh, just a matter of days. And we should real quickly say the state also uh, is arguing that informal federal policy can't trump state law, along with the fact that it, it, you know it could be a real problem if we wind up winning. The state winds up winning uh, later on in the courts to have to uh, go back and redo everything. They're also saying they shouldn't even get this far anyway because 
it's a it's policy as opposed to our Arizona's law. That's right. Unlike a lot of Arizona's other recent forays into illegal immigration policy, this isn't a preemption case, really. You know, some stuff like SB 1070, that's straight federal preemption. Federal law preempts state law. This, you know, this isn't federal law. It's a policy, prosecutorial discretion, as you mentioned, Luigi. And, you know, they're saying this is a 14th Amendment. This is equal protection. There's, you know, as you mentioned, the courts are saying, well, if you give these doc deferred action recipients licenses, you can't deny them to these ones. But, you know, that's one thing the governor's office certainly does have is that this is not not federal law, it's simply you know, an informal policy. Well, and driver's licenses have historically been under the purview of the states. I mean, different states have different rules, different laws when it comes to licenses, and that's been accepted by the federal government. Yeah. All right. Well, so we'll see what happens with that, especially as far as the state is concerned. But uh, again, by Tuesday, we could be seeing driver's licenses issued. Um, the state is also seeking a stay in campaign finance in this particular ruling. Really. Give us a background on this. What's happening? Yeah, this is a very interesting case. One of those uh, you know, uh, small things that could grow pretty big. And in this case, uh, there was a lady out of Fountain Hills. Uh, she was uh, upset and did not like a bond, uh, a local bond measure, and started to gather her friends and started uh, putting up uh, signs that they had made themselves. Well, the uh, the city then told them you had to register as a political committee. And she, their reaction was, "That's pretty onerous. You know, it, we're not spending a whole lot of money." Um, and so decided to sue. And now a uh, uh, federal district court judge had ruled that our definition of a political committee is overly broad and it covers too much, too many things, and therefore it is unconstitutional. Now, mind you, that definition is about uh, 183 words. Or, uh, this, the period is at the very end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, a little bit complex. Yeah. Right. The federal judge said uh, over unconstitutionally vague and overbroad, and the uh, you know 183 words of run-on sentences I think covers the vague part. Mm -hmm. The you know the most important part of this isn't just that he struck down the definition of political committee. It's that almost the entire rest of our campaign finance regulatory scheme is based on that definition. So registration requirements for PACs, for independent expenditure committees, for candidate committees. You can't enforce those anymore right now. Uh, disclosure requirements, the campaign finance reports, all of those are contingent on that one definition. And right now, you legally cannot enforce any of those. I was going to say, some are saying that the judge's ruling basically means open field. It kind of throws the state's election system into chaos. I mean, everything is unknown right now. Everything is sort of up for grabs. I mean, under this... Yeah, the Secretary of State's office can't require you to submit your campaign finance report. They can't go after somebody who's been accused of violating, you know, some of these dark money groups that are being accused of violating regulations. They can't go after them. And, and, and again, this is because of this, this definition of a political committee being too vague. Right. Uh, can't, can't the state just go back and, and put a couple more periods and semicolons? The state certainly could. Uh, you need the state legislature to go ahead and do that. So either we wait until the legislature actually acts and perhaps redefines uh, what a political committee is or they do a, a you know, special session, which is very unlikely. It's the holidays are coming and uh, they're busy with whatever they are doing. Uh, but, uh, you know, Lee is right. Um, it's confusing right now. What we have before this ruling is a system where it's, where, that says essentially that if I, as a resident and a citizen, if I were to spend my own money, put up my own yard signs for or against a candidate or a ballot measure, I don't have to register as a political committee. There's no, it's just me speaking, you know, ex exercising my First Amendment right. However, if I corral Jeremy doing the same thing, we have to register as a political committee. That's essentially how it, this, this system works. And so it, regardless of how, uh, you know, the, how small the effort is or how big it is, if I started having my friends, if we started coming together uh, uh, and spending for or against a ballot measure or a bond measure or a candidate, we have to register as a political committee. So basically, one's a voice, two's a committee? Is that what we're um, hearing? Well, no one's a committee right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> now, what's interesting, you know, fortunately for the state, you know, for the election officials, I'm sure they're very happy about this, is that the last campaign finance report of the season was due the day before this ruling came out, and the next one won't be due for until the end of January 2016. So, there, so there's problems that could have caused that won't cause because of that, but cities, counties, they're all dependent on the same laws. The city, Phoenix, Tucson, other cities, they have elections next year. Can, you know, candidates are filing, they are getting ready to launch campaigns, they have to file right now. Ballot measure committees that have uh, filing requirements and you know, contribution disclosure requirements, 
that's off the top of them, recall committees, um, and as uh, Leah mentioned, uh, complaints. There are right. about 22 right. pending complaints with the Secretary of State's office right now. They cannot enforce any of those right now, and if this ruling stands, they'll all get tossed. And the ones that have moved further on in the process say this long-running campaign finance saga with Attorney General Tom Horn. If this ruling stands, that's probably out the window. He's right. off the hook. Yeah. Same for the Free Enterprise Club, the, you know, which is accused of uh, being kind of a dark money front group. That's uh, with a law enforcement investigation right now, too, and that would be out the window as well. Right, and Jeremy is correct. It's a state of confusion that we are in. I don't reckon, however, uh, that uh, lawyers, election lawyers would be advising, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> clients who just started doing you know, a whole lot of stuff that otherwise would be considered illegal. I think everybody's going to stand aside and see how this all shakes out. And at the end of the day, I don't believe that we're not going to have something in place to either correct uh, our definition or, um, or make sure that we have something that's actually working. I mean, at the end of the day, we do have to enforce. Um, you know, there are certain uh, reporting requirements uh, that we, we have been doing, and I don't, it, it's hard for me to foresee those uh, requirements being just undone and not doing something about it. And we, we talked to Tom Collins about this clean elections director. He basically said, just just make it clear it, it deals with committees and not candidates and move on. Can it be that simple? Well, if it goes for the legislature, nothing's ever that simple. Um, it kind of depends what everybody wants to do and what it looks like. And, you know, you're looking at a, you know, Republican-led legislature that, that wants as few regulations as possible. But, yeah, it seems like you've got to have something. Though. Yeah, well, that's yeah. a really good point. I mean, how, how far is the legislature going to go on something like well, this? Well, who knows? I mean, it depends on what they really want to do. If they want to do the simplest fix possible, you can simply adopt the federal definition or something similar to it, which is much more concise, has many of the same elements, has already withstood uh, judicial scrutiny. But the question is, do other people, other, plenty of other folks over there have some ideas about changes they'd like to make to campaign finance? I've talked to some campaign finance attorneys who said we should use this as an opportunity to completely overhaul, mm. you know, a lot of our election laws. Indeed. So, you know, do you do that? How long does it take? Can you get it in place immediately? And if you can't, how long does it go? And another interesting thing on the enforcement side, even if they get this done very quickly, immediately, all those old complaints probably still have to go because they will all still have been filed under a defective law under a constitutionally defective law. I reckon the Secretary of State will probably go for the simplest fix. They want something that they can use to enforce our uh, election laws right away. So they'll probably go for something simple. Uh, but you know, as you know, the politicians always have a <laughs> tendency to be as, you know, as, uh, they have the ability to surprise. Yes. Let's just say that. And so let's see what happens next year. Okay, let's see what's going to happen regarding education funding now as we discuss this. And again, the legislature, we're back in the courts here, they want to stay as far as this ruling that $317 million must be paid this year. We're not even talking about the, the billion back pay. We're not even right. there yet. Uh, where do we stand on this? Because it, again, the legislature still needs to find this $317 extra million. But maybe not this year, and that's what they're asking for. I mean, it's kind of the legal minutia is sort of where we're at with this. Basically, they file the stay saying, you know, let's hold off on paying this while we can appeal. And they're already, they've already said they're gonna move ahead with an appeal. So it's just kind of trying to keep everything on hold as long as they possibly can. And there are some lawmakers who have said, you know, we know we're probably gonna have to pay something. We're still debating what, but let's try and delay it as long as we can, especially when we're facing the budget shortfall we are. What happened to the negotiations with districts we heard about a while back? I don't know. I haven't heard much about that lately. I think the negotiations are all between lawyers right now. Uh, you know, the lawmakers are arguing that the courts do not have the power to retroactively make and pay back this money. They're saying that, you know, perspective, this ruling can be perspective going forward. We have to make these inflationary increases, but you know, all perspective, not uh, retroactively, which would certainly get us out of somewhat of a bind. It would, you know, help us out with about 317 million of this 520 million deficit uh, we're facing for the current fiscal year. You know, after that, all bets are off again. But, right. but the courts are basically saying the legislature ignored the will of the voters. Right. The, uh, the Arizona Supreme Court already ruled last year that uh, the state ignored the will of the voters, that the money had to be funded. The state is now saying, well, that opinion by the Arizona Supreme Court uh, only applies to now moving forward. So it's not retroactive. And the trial court judge does not have the authority to then reset what that inflation funding level is. So that's uh, one of the state's arguments. That's a very interesting and curious, curious argument, if you will. If you, if you logically break it down, it would mean that um, if the the mandate for the state to pay for something that the voters have approved, 
um, if uh, violating that order uh, would only then mean you pay for it uh, uh, moving forward and not have to remedy what's been withheld from, in this case, the schools, then, you know, what's to prevent what? the state legislature from doing it again? Just saying, let's let, wait for that lawsuit. In the three years that we litigate this, um, we'll just say at the end of it, we don't have to pay for it. And, you know, p pick, a, pick a program, a voter approved program. And presumably you can do that. Well, yeah, well, what's the point of having these things if the legislature can say no and then when they're told it's yes, then the whole time they said no, they're off the hook? That's the question. That's what we're waiting for the judge to decide. Well, that would make it a lot easier to deal with uh, budget crises. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's certainly part of the approach <laughs> yeah. a few years ago during the last one is do it now. We'll figure out whether it's legal later because it's, emerg it's an emergency. You know, the same reason why... You know, like during the governor's race, you heard a lot of uh, criti you know, Duval criticizing Ducey, saying, oh, well, he wants to appeal his case, we should pay it immediately. Ducey's trying to buy time. I mean, they're all trying to buy time just because nobody knows where to turn with this budget deficit. The, there's no real obvious solutions the, the, here. They have a second uh, main point, if you will. The state has a, a second argument, and that's that the, and that's basically that the power to appropriate solely belongs to the state legislature, and the courts cannot mandate lawmakers how to appropriate funds. They can't say, hey, you got to prioritize, in this case, education. you got to make an education. You're the first thing you have to make whole and ignore or cut uh, every, everything else. And of course, the uh, lawyers for the schools, the school districts are saying, well, you know, that's, that's the wrong way of looking at it. There's a law that you violated, and therefore we're trying to seek a remedy for that Yeah, violation. I mean, it, you, you can't, it, again, it seems like it's common sense where you can't just say, no, we're not going to pay it, and by the way, that's, that's, that's okay. Well, it's government, government and politics. Nothing is ever really common sense. <laughs> well, and we're talking about the budget battle. Let's, let's get it. We talked about it a little bit uh, this last week, and nothing much has changed, I'm sure. Uh, what is the latest here? What, what are you hearing as far as solutions to this deficit and what could be just this major deficit in the next fiscal year? I think right now everybody's kind of waiting to see, number one, what Governor Ducey wants to do, and number two, how he's going to work with the legislature. We sat down with Andy Biggs, Senate President, recently, and he, I think, is really excited in thinking that maybe the legislature and the governor on January 16th can stand together and say, here, look, we have our budget, we're ready to go, which didn't happen under Governor Brewer. Right. Now, that's probably wishful thinking. Um, you know, that's assuming everybody gets along and everybody agrees on absolutely everything and everything is perfect and rosy. I don't know that we're going to see that this session. If we do see that session, what will we see? I haven't the faintest <laughs> idea. So if you have, for fiscal year 2016, you have a projected billion dollar deficit. That's out of a, about a $9.2 billion budget. About a little under $4 billion of that is K-12. Can't touch that. You have to increase that as per the court's order. You know, another billion or so is corrections. You can't cut that unless you're going to start cutting prisoners loose. You've got $1.3 billion for Medicaid. Can't cut that. You, you have you know a few hundred million for the department, new Department of Child Safety. Politically, you can't really touch that. You effectively have about two thirds of this 9.2 billion dollar budget, and it's for for legal or political reasons untouchable. They cannot balance this with cuts alone. It is even the staunchest fiscal conservatives over there will tell you that it is impossible. Yet. No one's going to raise taxes. You know, Doug Ducey has said he won't raise taxes. Even if he wanted to, you'd never get it through the legislature. A lot of these one-time gimmicks we used the last time around, fund sweeps, you know, sell, you know, mortgaging off state buildings, securitizing lottery revenue, a lot of those aren't available anymore. Some of those funds haven't been replenished. You can't sell the state capital twice. You can't securitize <laughs> sure lottery you can. revenue sell twice. twice. And then a few years down the road when the courts come <laughs> after you, say, okay, fine, but, you know. So, but in the end, yeah, there's no obvious solution. I'm fascinated to see well, what they're going to well, come up with. And you mentioned, you're, you mentioned cuts. Uh, that is perhaps the only one thing that our conservative lawmakers have agreed on, that there needs to be cuts. And of course, the level of those cuts, and Jeremy pointed out, the complications of doing those cuts are enormous. Uh, of course, there are other things that they have in mind. For example, um, you, you know, mentioned some of the gimmicks. Now, some of those gimmicks are off limits. We can't do them again, Jeremy pointed out. Some of those gimmicks we may be able to do again. And uh, mind you, our lawmakers are very enterprising people. I mean, they're, they're and they, they might just surprise you. Are you talking rollovers, things like that? Roll, they could do rollovers again. Nothing stopped them from doing that before. Um, you know, they could do, that's a, that's a perfect example of an accounting gimmick. Perfectly legal. Um, there will be a lot of uh, you know, cr cr criticisms and what have you, but they've done it before. Um, now, Andy Biggs, in that, um, in one of the articles I, I've read from the Republic, basically said no, he wants to do structural changes. He wants to do 
he wants to look at fundamentally how the state funds it, its operations and maybe find a way so that we don't have to deal with this problem on an ongoing basis. Now, that's very ambitious. Uh, I wonder if he's thinking, he didn't say it, he didn't elaborate on it, but I wonder if he's thinking, if he's thinking about a structurally balanced budget, which is different from just you know, balancing right. the budget. And if, you, if he's referring to a structurally balanced budget, that's an enormous amount of pain that we would have to go through to get there. But maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't mind suffering too much. Yeah, he's it, he's also talked about zero-based budgeting, which again would be a huge change for how you do it. Basically, you're starting over at the beginning with zero revenue, zero expenses at the beginning of every year. Every fiscal year, yeah. Um, he's tried it with a couple of small agencies. I think they're kind of looking at it, but he said it's been very small agencies they've tried it with. And I, an entire state budget would be interesting to see. Is that the kind of thing that could fly, you think? Would people go for something like that? Um, that's, qu that's quite a Herculean effort. And <laughs> I think, you know, last time we had a major crisis, people talked about, you know, massive structural changes. We're going to change the way we do budgeting. And you know what? We didn't do any of that stuff. We raised taxes for three years and you know, made a bunch of cuts and called it a day. I remember and, and Brewer had a lot of ambitious ideas about what you wanted to change. And they all sound good when you're in the middle of an emergency, but when you actually have to get down to the nuts and bolts of fixing it, you gotta do whatever you can to fix right. it. I mean, you have to remember also, they were in a panic mode. I mean, every, every single year, they had to f come up with something to fix a, a budget that was, that was bleeding. I mean, revenues were drying up. And so when you're in a panic mode, you can't really think thoroughly about what you're gonna do. now. Now this time, however, we have you know Justin Olson thinking about maybe we can look at efficiencies, so how to make government more efficient. Now he mentioned the biomedical center uh, campus in Phoenix. He said two years ago they got eight million bucks. That's basically for about thirty more students. And so he broke it down and said that's about that's roughly two hundred thirty thousand dollars per student. Now why is it that high when the uh, University of Arizona campus in Fe in Tucson rather, um, the, you know the per student funding there. For their uh, for their center uh, is much lower, and what can we do? So we might see things like that. Now, uh, even those would be very ambitious. I mean, mind you, the 1.5 billion dollars that we're facing, we're only facing it in fiscal 15 and fiscal 16. We're also facing another billion in the year after, and about 800 million the year well, after. And that gets into the corporate tax cuts. And again, I, I know that those are supposed to be off limits. We'll see just how far off limits those are. I, I, before we go, we only got a couple of minutes left here. Uh, Diane Douglas, I think, uh, raised some eyebrows. Uh, the, her office raised some eyebrows this week by suggesting maybe we don't need to overhaul Common Core first day of business. Yes, her staff said that she probably would not overhaul it the first day of business, which is interesting because she really can't overhaul it the first day of business. Basically, you need the Board of Education, which, you know, there's an entire process there. You need legislation. You need all kinds of different things. So no matter what happens, Douglas could not come in day one and say, okay, bye-bye, Common Core, we're done. Was, was this her understanding this, do you think, or is this her basically saying, let's get the transition process, and, and I think she used the word, or the, her office used the word process for the first year. I think it's an acknowledgement of reality. I mean, she can campaign against Common Core because she doesn't like it, and a lot of people don't like it, and obviously, you know, those people elected her, but I mean, she understands that she can't, you know, there's nothing she can do on her own. And if no one, I think if no one else is gonna make a move to do this, all, you, all she can really do is use it as a bully pulpit to really no effect if no one else is going to take any action. So there's so many, you know, she's admi you know, the chief administrator of you know, this large school system. There's so much other work to do. You know, you can shout into the wind all you want, but it's not really going to do much if the legislature and the Board of Education and Governor Ducey aren't going to go along with you. Well, and, and, yeah, and I of course she has, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. I think others will take action. I think we will see some stuff with the legislature um, you know, bills, what do you do with funding? There's some ways to kind of get around and underneath and kind of gut Common Core that can be easily done to legend. I think we'll see some of that. Right. I was, I was going to say that, of course, her, her job, her primary job is to be an administrator. Uh, the first thing that she will administer is this test, this Common Core test that we'll have um, next year. We already paid for it. The money's already there for it for at least one year. Now, whether they fund it again the next year, that's, uh, you know, that's, the, that's a, a big question as well. But it is her job to administer this test, and she has to show that she can administer. I mean, that's what we elected her for. And again, her office is saying she's not so much against Common Core as supporting local control. So again, we'll, we'll see how this uh, this works itself out as the as the uh, it's certainly the a process. softening of it's tone. Just, if yes, else. yes. Monday on Arizona Horizon, the uh, state could face a wet winter due to El Nino weather patterns, and the growth of microbreweries is prompting calls for changes in state law. That's Monday on the next Arizona Horizon. 
That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.